Hi everybody and welcome to the tax update for August. Um, I will get us kicked off straight away. I know we've all got lunches to get to. Uh, just a bit of disclaimer at the beginning. While uh, every effort has been made to provide valuable, useful information in this presentation, uh, nothing, or oh, please do not rely on any of the advice given. Uh, please always seek individual advice related to your circumstances. Okay, so by way of introduction, my name is Jenna. I am a manager here in the business advisory department here at Vincent's. Um, I will be, sorry, I forgot to click the slide over, there we go. Um, if you have any questions in relation to today's session, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. My contact details are on the slide. Okay, so a brief rundown of what we will be going through today. Um, first, I'll run you through a couple of reminders, things that the ATO has released. Um, I'll have a bit of a look at some recent ATO activity reminders they've been releasing themselves. Um, discuss a couple of little tax topics that I think will be relevant for the year going forward. And then just a couple of COVID comments. So reminders. I'm uh, going to start with single touch payroll. Now, first of all, the 2021 single touch payroll finalizations for all employers were due on either the 14th of July or the 31st of July, if you were impacted by COVID-19 and needed a little bit more time. Uh, if you haven't yet submitted your finalization declarations, you will need to do so as soon as possible. Um, just a quick reminder too, if you have changed software during the year, you do need to make sure all of the information from both softwares has been included correctly. Um, if you're a paid employee and you are looking at lodging your tax return, please make sure that the payroll data that is sitting in the system is tax ready. If it's not tax ready, maybe wait for your employer to do so. Um, sticking with single touch payroll, so micro employers from 1 July 2021, so this year, uh, the quarterly STP reporting concession that was previously afforded is now no longer available. It is only available to very limited micro employers in certain circumstances. What this means is employers will now need to be conducting their STP reporting per pay event, not quarterly. Um, again, single touch payroll, there have been exemptions as people come into the STP reporting regime. Um, the previously closely held employer employers uh, now have been brought into the regime from 1 July 2021 and they will need to start reporting. Employers with withholder payer numbers still remain outside of the employers required to report under STP, but bear in mind they will need to join in or from 1 July 2022. Uh, the ATO does still have some discretion to grant exemptions to certain employers. Uh, this is really around those that have trouble with connections with the internet and things like that. So they're not really commonplace. Um, if you have any concerns about STP reporting, please reach out to us. We are more than happy to help if you're not all over it already. Okay, some other reminders uh, is the fuel tax credit rates. So they have increased from the 2nd of July 2021 in line with the fuel excise indexation. Um, just a reminder that if you're claiming fuel tax credits, the claim does depend on when the fuel was acquired. So it is important to check as the rates change over that you are applying the right rate when you're preparing your claims. Um, another reminder that taxable payments annual reports are due for lodgement on the 28th of August. Uh, sorry. If your organisation provides services or pays contractors for cleaning, courier, delivery or road freight, building and construction, IT or security surveillance services, you should already be familiar with watching this report. Um, with COVID-19 in the past year, there probably are a couple more organisations out there that would have had to start providing these services or engaging them, which may mean that more people are brought into this reporting then. Uh, if you're unsure of what your reporting requirements might be, again, please reach out to Vincent's and your advisor and we should be able to guide you on that. 
And then my final reminder that I have is in relation to the super guarantee rate. So the super guarantee rate increased from 9.5% to 10% from 1 July 2021. Now, the rate used by employers when they're calculating the super guarantee contributions will depend on the period in which the employee is paid, not necessarily when the work was performed. So, for example, if you had an employee that had a fortnightly pay period from the 23rd of June to the 6th of July, and you then paid them on the 7th of July, you would be applying the full 10% to the payment that you're making to them. So the 10% relates to all of the days that have been paid from 1 July, not just the days worked. Um, so in saying that, if you're an employer who had pay periods that were straddling that 1 July day, it's probably worth a quick review just to make sure you applied the 10% for the full period. Um, similarly, if you're an employee and you again had a pay period that straddled that 1 July, maybe check that the superannuation has been paid correctly on that pay. All right, moving along now to some ATO activity. All right, I'm going to start off. Um, the ATO has issued a notice that they will be obtaining data on insurance policies for lifestyle assets to do some data matching. So they'll be looking at the 2021, 2022 and 2023 income tax years for this program. And they're looking to focus on marine vessels costing over 100,000, motor vehicles, including caravans, over $65,000, thoroughbred horses costing over 65,000, fine art around 100,000 per item and aircraft over 150,000. Now, the data obtained from these insurance policies will include identification details in relation to the individual, as well as policy details of the items insured. Um, what the ATO are trying to do is they want to match these records and identify issues in a number of areas, such as identifying taxpayers who may be accumulating or improving assets where insufficient income to support that improvement has been reported in their income tax returns. Um, going to use it to identify transactions where potential CGT assets have been disposed of and not necessarily declared in income tax returns. Uh, will also help them identify incorrect GST claims where taxpayers may have sought to claim input tax credits in their business where assets are actually being privately used. will also assist them in identifying unreported FBT liabilities, again, where businesses are holding assets that are really being used for private purposes. And then lastly, identify SMSFs who are again acquiring assets put to the benefit and use of trustees or beneficiaries of the fund. So throughout this program, the ATO estimates they'll get approximately 300,000 individuals data each year to have a bit of a look into. Uh, the ATO have also released a reminder to taxpayers to make sure donations are being claimed correctly in their returns. So in the prior year, approximately two thirds of the donations were actually denied because taxpayers couldn't support the donation that they'd made. So by way of reminder, they've just said that make sure that the organisation you are making a gift to is actually a deductible gift recipient. If you're unsure of this, you can check the ABR website and that will tell you. Um, also make sure that any donations made that you're claiming do not include any kind of expectation of a monetary or personal benefit. So thinking raffle tickets, things like that, where you may receive something from it, generally not a deductible gift. Um, the other area where people had claims denied, denied was they just didn't have any records to support the donations that they were making. Um, another release from the ATO, they've kind of put a bit of a spotlight on property investment. So they've issued a media release just reminding property investors to take care when submitting their income tax returns. Um, I identified some common mistakes that are being made in relation to rental properties and also holiday homes. So the key ones being neglecting to declare all income. Uh, this is not only rental income, but also income from the disposal of properties. So as the ATO get more and more information and better data matching capabilities, they are getting information from third parties. They can see where property is rented. So it's really easy for them to track where it hasn't been reported correctly. 
Um, another area they'll be looking at is where rental deductions are unusually high. They do have a lot of data analytics that run in the background of their returns. So if significant claims have been made in one year, you should probably expect the ATO to come along and ask some questions. So just make sure you have the information behind that to support any deductions. Uh, other comment or other mistakes they commonly see are interest claims being made on private loans. So where interest is redrawn from loans that were previously rental property related loans for more personal use, um, the interest is no longer deductible. So again, just watch the deductibility there. Um, there's also immediate claims for capital works. Just a reminder, if you're doing improvements, significant improvements, capital works on rental and investment properties, they're generally not immediately deductible. They will be deductible over a few years. And then the last comment is rental income during COVID. So as a general guidance, you know, rental income is only really accessible when, um, when it's really received. So if things have been deferred, we may not need to be reporting all of the income. So just keeping that in mind. Um, staying with a bit of a COVID theme, we have seen the ATO are uh, conducting reviews of certain COVID-19 support payments that occurred in prior years, things like JobKeeper and the cash flow boost. Um, these reviews can be as simple as conducting a phone call and asking a couple of questions or even requesting supporting documentation and asking for reasons as to why certain activities occurred. Um, a decision impact statement was released quite recently for BNBM, that's the Federal Commissioner of Taxation, which outlined the ATO's application of the integrity rule, which was within the cash flow boost for employers coronavirus economic response package act. Sorry, I just had to read that because it's very long. Um, basically, in this case, what happened was the applicant company was found to have entered into a scheme with the sole and dominant purpose of obtaining the cash flow boost. So what they did, they paid director wages of 107,500 in one week, whereas previously it had been a long established pattern that they paid $100 per week. So the Administrative Appeals Tribunal agreed with the commissioner that the applicant company did this for the sole purpose of getting the cash flow boost which then means they have not satisfied the integrity rule and therefore were not entitled to the cash flow boost. So just keep an eye out for that. You know, if you've gone through your Vincent's advisors, I'm sure we're all fine, but just be aware that is happening. Um, so what have we got next? Super recontribution. So again, COVID-19, um, there, there was the ability to access an early release of superannuation up to an amount of 20,000, which could be accessed by those who suffered some kind of financial hardship due to the pandemic. Um, there have been recent legislative amendments passed, which will now allow individuals to recontribute up to the amount they withdrew without it impacting any of their non-concessional caps. So as provided, these three contributions are made between 1 July, 2021 and 30 June, 2030. Um, they shouldn't impact or reduce any of the capacity within the caps. And then the last little comment from the ATO was in relation to tax scams. So every year when the new year ticks over, the ATO tend to notice a bit of an upkick in reports of email text message scams of people trying to steal personal credit card information. So at the moment, it seems a scam as a pretending to be MyGov customer care. Um, team members um, sending emails that include screenshots of government ID or MyGov ID apps asking for verification of identity and things like that and tend to involve clicking onto a further link. So the ATO have made it pretty clear they will never send text messages or emails that include any kind of link to an external site. If you are receiving them, please don't click them, probably ignore them. Contact the ATO and report that you've received these emails and delete the email. Okay, and I think that's really all I have in the ATO activity updates. So we'll now have a quick look at a couple of tax topics that I just think will be of interest over the next year. So the first one 
Um, so at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, the government certainly introduced a number of different measures to assist businesses, some of them designed to encourage investment in business assets. So between the existing concessions that were in place, um, new concessions they brought in and then changes that they were making along the way to these different concessions, it did get a bit tricky to know what rules applied at what any given time to which taxpayers. So thankfully, uh, the different kind of combinations all seem to end on 30 June 2021 and we're now left with one overarching temporary full expensing of business assets, which is the one that's relevant for the 2020 income tax year. So relevant to those assets that you're out buying now. So we'll explore this just so that you know what it really means. Um, so businesses that are eligible for the temporary full expensing are those with an aggregated turnover of less than 5 billion and corporate entities that meet the alternative test. So I won't go into detail here about the corporate entities that meet the alternate test, um, but basically it's a way for corporate entities that don't come under that 5 billion aggregated turnover to get into this temporary full expensing. So for the 2022 income tax year, an eligible entity can claim a deduction for the business portion of the cost of all eligible new assets first held, used or installed ready for use for business purposes prior to 30 June 2020, as well as eligible second hand assets that were not only installed, held, ready for use by 30 June 2020, um, but with secondhand assets, you also have the second hoops jump through of the entity's aggregated turnover needs to be less than 50 million. So not all entities can claim the secondhand ones. Um, eligible assets also, or eligible new asset costs also include improvements that you've incurred prior to 30 June 2022. So these can be improvements to either eligible assets or existing assets that you had that would have been eligible had they been purchased within the correct period. Um, eligible assets then also include um, assets of small business entities that are using the simplified depreciation rules and the balance of any small business pools. So you've probably heard me say, or try to say eligible assets a number of times now. Um, most assets are eligible assets being depreciable assets. However, there are some exclusions. So the key exclusions are assets that are already allocated to low value pools or software development pools, certain primary production assets where their primary production depreciating assets unless they're small businesses, um, buildings and other capital works which fall under a completely different division, and then assets that are, will either never be located in Australia or never be used principally in Australia for the purposes of carrying on a business. So there are key exclusions any other business assets should fall under the temporary expensing. Now, the thing to note with temporary expensing is you can actually opt out of using the temporary expensive for an income year on an asset by asset basis. Um, the opt out is only available though if you're not using simplified depreciation. So if you're a small business using simplified depreciation, you don't get a choice. Any other business, you can still opt out. So um, the opting out and choices made are easily notified to the ATO via the lodgement of your income tax return. So nothing special that has to be done there. Um, the reason that they've included this opt out is really because the initial feedback they received in relation to the temporary expensing was it was generating some not ideal tax outcomes. So I think trusts that are trying to distribute income and now ending up with no income to distribute. Uh, companies who might have been wanting to pay tax and frank dividends now have no income to pay tax on. So they have now left the option in there to opt in or out of temporary full expensing. The next tax topic that I was going to have a bit of a look at and take you through is the loss carry back tax offset. Now, this offset provides a refundable tax offset for eligible corporate entities, which can be claimed in the 2021 and 2022 income tax returns. 
So the offset works by allowing eligible entities to choose to carry back losses they might have incurred in 2020, 2021 or 2022 to earlier years in which they had income tax liabilities. So the offset effectively represents the tax the eligible entity would save if it was able to deduct the loss in the earlier year using the lost year's tax rate. So two key things to note about the loss carryback tax offset. Firstly, the offset is a refundable tax offset. What this means is there's a likelihood of a cash refund resulting. Secondly, the carryback is a choice. So if you're an entity, you've incurred a loss, you don't have to carry the loss back. It is your choice as to whether you want to do that or not. You may wish to carry it forward and use it in a later income tax year. That's up to you. So how do we get the loss carryback tax offset? Uh, to be considered an eligible corporate entity, you must be a company, corporate limited partnership, or a public trading trust throughout the income year you're claiming the tax offset, the income year you choose to carry the loss back to, and any of the income years in between, and a small business entity in the year, in the loss year, or you would have been a small business entity if the aggregated turnover test threshold was 5 billion. So really broadening that scope there. So as I said earlier, the loss carried back can be used for tax losses made in 2020, 21 and 22 income tax years. Um, I do note, however, that there is no ability to claim the offset in the 2020 income tax return. So the 2021 years that are being lodged now is really the first chance that we have to access the offset. Um, the loss carry back does only apply to revenue losses as well. So capital losses, um, certain tax losses arising from a conversion of excess franking credits um, and transferred losses relating to either foreign banking corps or head companies of consolidated groups are all excluded. Uh, the period for which the loss can be carried back to recoup income tax liabilities is also not indefinite. So tax losses made in the relevant years can be carried as far back as 2019 income tax year. So that means that losses in 2020 can only be carried back to 2019. Similarly, losses in 21 can only be carried back to 2020 or 2019. Um, in working out the amount of your offset, the amount of loss being carried back is also required to be reduced by any net exempt income in the year you are carrying the loss back to. Uh, so if you're carrying back multiple years of losses, you won't have to apply that net income, that net exempt income, sorry, multiple times. It, once it's applied, that's it. You won't have to apply it again. Uh, the last important point to note about the loss carry back offset is that the amount of offset available to you is limited to the franking account balance on the last day of the income year in which you're claiming the offset. Lots of words there. So what that means is if I am carrying, say, my 2020 loss back and claiming against the 2019 income tax liability, this can only be lodged as part of preparing my 2021 income tax return. So I am limited to whatever the balance of my Frankie account is at the end of 2021, the year in which I'm claiming that offset. So I understand that might be a bit confusing with all of the years being thrown around and different things. So I might go through an example now just to make that a bit clearer. So what we're going to do is run through this example. This is an extract from the ATO website. I haven't made this up myself. Um, thank you, ATO. Um, it's a pretty basic example, but I think it gets the key ideas across. So step one involves a couple of little micro steps within it. So, and that really looks at the losses being carried back. So the first thing we need to do is determine the amount of tax loss that we're looking to carry back. So per the facts of this information, XYZ has a tax loss of 100,000 in the 2020 income tax year. So that's our step 1A amount. That's the loss that we're looking to carry back. Step 1B then requires us to work out the net exempt income that has not previously been applied. Again, per the facts of this scenario, we don't actually have any exempt income. So I'll 
probably clarifying being 2020 loss, we can only carry it back to 2019. So we're looking for that net exempt income in 19. So per the facts, we don't have any exempt income. So our step 1B amount is zero. Step 1C, we will reduce our loss amount by any net exempt income. So as I previously, previously said, no, no net exempt income, no reduction. So our step 1C amount stays at 100,000. The final step as part of step one is we need to multiply the loss that we're carrying back by the tax rate of the income year in which the loss was made. Now, this example is pretty simple. They've said the income tax rate was 30%. So we multiply 100,000 by 30% to get 30,000. So the, in the end, our step one amount will be the 30,000. Uh, if you're carrying back more than one year of tax losses um, to the same early income tax year, you will need to do all of these step one amounts for each loss year being carried back and add them together. So if I was carrying back both 20 losses and 2021 losses to 2019, I would do step one for both and then add them together. So moving on to step two is where they require a comparison of a step one amount to the income tax liability of the year that we're carrying the loss back to. So the amount of the offset is capped by the income tax liability of that year. So in this particular case, we can see that the income tax liability in 2019 was 40,000. So as our 30,000 calculated in step one is less than the 40,000 income tax liability of 2019, we have no reduction in our offset at this stage. So we're still sitting at 30,000 potential tax offset. Um, step three will, what happens in step three will only really apply if you're carrying back losses to more than one earlier income year. So I think 2022, if I'm carrying losses back to 19 and 20, that's where step three comes into play. So what you'll need to do at step three is you'll need to apply steps one and two and then add those results together for uh, the lost years being carried back. Um, as we're only carrying back one year, we won't be looking at this step, we don't have to do anything. So we have no changes at step three. Um, and finally, step four, you're required to compare the total amount calculated. <laughs> My lights have just turned off in the room. Um, under step three, to the franking account balance at the end of the income year in which you're claiming the offset, um, with the offset being limited to that balance. So in this particular example, we will be claiming the offset in the 2021 income tax return. Again, per the facts, we can see that the franking account has a balance of only $25,000. This is less than the $30,000 we've calculated in all of the steps above. So we are now capped at a loss carryback tax offset of only $25,000. So hopefully that kind of made a bit more sense in the process. Um, if not, again, Vincent is always here to help. Um, one thing to keep in mind is this is a pretty simple example. I haven't added in multiple years or much in the way of net exempt income. Um, I think one of the key things to keep in mind is tax rates can change between years. So if you're dealing with base rate entities, there will be a range of tax rates from 27.5% to 25% over the period that the offset's available. So just keep in mind that the rate to apply back at step one is the rate in the year in which the loss is made. Not the year you're claiming it, not the year you're carrying it back to, the year the loss is made. Okay. And then our last little section now, we'll just have a bit of a look at some COVID-19 topics. So I'm going to keep this brief because there's a lot of information out there and a lot of states offering different things, but I just thought it might be good to have a quick little run through of some basic information that's out there. So uh, starting in Queensland, there are $5,000 grants available. I believe the applications actually opened at midday today. Um, and they're available to eligible small businesses um, and not-for-profit not organisations, as well as large tourism and hospitality businesses. 
um, across Queensland that were affected by the lockdowns that we had in August. So eligible businesses will just need to show a reduction in turnover during a nominated seven day period, uh, which overlaps with at least one day of the recent lockdowns. So I think uh, Southeast Queensland and Northern Queensland might have different dates, but as long as it overlaps, you should be fine. Uh, in New South Wales, there's obviously a lot going on. They're really in the thick of it right now. Um, there is a lot on offer for impacted businesses. Um, support ranges from one-off grants to assist with those impacted in the initial three weeks of the lockdown. Um, that extends onto then job saver payments, which are fortnightly payments designed to help maintain the employee headcount from 13 July. So these apply from that fourth week of lockdown and continue through to the current restrictions. Um, they also have micro grants available, which are fortnightly payments for businesses with turnover between 30,000 and 75,000. Um, it is my understanding too, there are still some rebates and reductions available for different government rates and charges within New South Wales. So um, with all of this, I recommend getting onto the state and federal government websites and just having a look and seeing what's available. Um, moving on to Victoria. So Victoria has the business cost assistance program that continues to run for businesses in eligible sectors to receive grants for assistance with business expenses. Uh, certain businesses that have previously received support under this program will be automatically receiving an additional second round payment. Uh, no further applications are required. Um, in South Australia, there are support grants available to businesses impacted by the lockdown and trading restrictions that started on the 20th of July, as well as those that have continued to be impacted by the trading restrictions from the 28th of July and still remain in place. Uh, lastly, on a state base, um, in light of their recent lockdown, the ACT have also announced grants of up to three thousand dollars for eligible businesses impacted um, and require uh, yet yeah, for the oh, businesses impacted sorry um, they have also foreshadowed that should their lockdowns continue there will be further assistance provided um, as a final note as well individuals do also have access to a range of support from both the federal and state support services um, this includes the pandemic leave disaster payment, as well as um, I know Victoria are offering test isolation payments as well. Um, if you are business individual looking for support, as I said, federal state government websites are a great source of information. Um, Vincent's is also here to help as well, should you require any assistance. And that now brings us to the end of the August tax update. Um, I hope you've take, been able to take something away from this. If you have any questions or require any assistance, please do not hesitate to reach out. Uh, thank you very much.